generation is starting over. And how far can we get with that? Community wealth is built on the shoulders of past generations and their knowledge and their influence and their ownership and their power. Many people are surprised that me as an entrepreneur, I'm also a storyteller of some of the stories. But, you know, as a frontier technologist and inventor entrepreneurs, in entrepreneur, we spend so much time telling stories to turn our imagination into reality. And we use those stories, as I said before, to attract investors, to attract customers, to attract people to work with us and work for us. If there's any doubt, Look at Steve Jobs and Apple. I started coding in the 1970s. I matriculated at Cornell in 1985 as computer science and electrical engineer. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mitch Kapoor, they were my heroes. I knew about them from the very beginning. Steve Jobs wasn't a technologist. He wasn't best in the world at technology. I'm not even sure if he coded that well. But what he was world class in was storytelling and weaving the narrative of these technologies and the impact that it would have on society. He also appreciated the power of the story and the importance of media and loved the media and spent a lot of time developing relationships with the media, which was unheard of back then when he was starting out with Apple, I think it was April Fool's Day of 1986, right? And it paid off. And the media loved him back. And he was able to raise money, basically guaranteeing sales with each product release, right? Brand awareness, market influence. Our multicultural entrepreneurs and founders need that. Because he or she who owns the story owns businesses, owns innovation. Are we in crisis mode? I mean, David sort of referenced that. Definitely. It's not just about seeing me or him or her represented on TV or in film. It is bigger than that. It is deeper than that. It's about owning the stories. It's about owning the studios. It's about owning the distribution network. The question isn't, did the tree make a sound when it fell if no one was there to hear it? The question is, did the tree make a sound or even exist at all if no one talks about it? And if the story doesn't spread, it's literally he or she who owns the story owns reality. And the economic recovery, right? I didn't know about Katherine Johnson when I was growing up. And I watched the movie, The Mission, firsthand. And I went on as a black woman, as David said, to raise $700 million to usher in this new digital media revolution in the mid-90s. We built three satellites with that money. We launched XM Radio with that money. We invested and collaborated in MP3 and MP4 with that money. And we launched the satellite over Africa first because Nelson Mandela had just become president and he asked us to. That's what you can do when a multicultural team owns <laughs> the media. We launched that satellite over Africa a year before we launched the one over the, uh, over the US that became Exxon Radio. It's that important and we need to take it that seriously. So I'm really excited about uh, joining this community. I thank you for including me in the tribe. I will be listening to the congressman and to, to Terrell, who actually did one of the startups based on our platform in Exxon Radio back in 99 or 2000. I'll be listening and paying attention as our future depends on it, because it does. No pressure from congressman. <laughs> thank you again, and I'll be
That means represent Florida's 10th district. The first in her family to graduate college, she became a social worker and then a police officer. She later made history by becoming Orlando's first female chief of police. Wow. Out there, she had an amazing career. Uh, that's only the beginning. She shepherded the department through financial crisis, championed policing strategies that put the community first, that showed the police and the community can work positively together, which is amazing. Clap for that. And for our fiscal folks, she oversaw a 40% reduction in violent crime. So that's a field of Thank you. Now, Carmen Demings is without a doubt a rising star in the Democratic caucus. She has also emerged as a powerful advocate of issues impacting economic, social, and political security for all Americans which she does from her seat on the Judiciary Committee and Homeland Security Committee. Fortunately for us, one of the issues Congressman Demings has decided to champion is media diversity, and we could not be happy with Congressman. She recently introduced a resolution that calls on Congress to reaffirm its commitment to media diversity and encourages efforts like this to work with industry to forge strategic partnerships and find common ground solutions. The, res the resolution <laughs> also designates a media diversity month to help us promote greater awareness and appreciation. Join me in welcoming our Congressional Media Diversity Champion, honorary host, and my friend, Congresswoman Sal Demings.
how society treats each other, how we vote, and how we live our daily lives. In 1968, I want you to think about 1968. I know there are some people in the room. I see young people who are like, when was that? Uh, but Think about, I know you read about it, what was going on in our country in 1968. The Kerner Commission report highlighted the media's role in a host of emotions that we feel, love, hate, concern, and highlighted the media's role and concluded that there was a critical increased need for diversity. Now let us fast forward to 2018. I won't stop from 2016 because that was tumultuous time for us. But let's fast forward to 2018. What terms are we now hearing? Fake news. Conservative news. Liberal media, mainstream stream media, and we're hearing a lot about the word bias. But the question remains for us today, and I can't wait to hear our panel, how are these media sources, all of them, all of them, helping to shape or frame how we think and how we act today? How, do, how does it help to frame police community relations. We hear the incidents, the tragic incidents that are taking place, but then when the story is told, how is it helping to frame or shape the conclusions that we come to? Tension between working families, people who have to go to work every day, and the social elites. How is the media helping to frame or shape hostility or empathy towards immigrant groups? How is the media helping to frame or shape what we think about children being separated at the border from their parents? Is there a lack of coverage or bias representation in the lives and realities of African American, Hispanic, Asian, and Middle Eastern, and others, communities. The question is, are we better off since the 1968 report in the area of media diversity? I'm excited about our all-star panel and the person who will bring it all together, our moderator. Terrell Whitley is a filmmaker, an entrepreneur, and the visionary media executive leader of Liquid Soap. Since founding the company in 2001, it has grown into one of the nation's leading brand marketing agencies Let's give a round of applause for that. Specializing in advertising, marketing, social media, or social media. I get the social media. <laughs> Entertainment, sports, and corporate brands. It is my honor right now to present your moderator of this very um, dynamic panel. Terrell Whitney.
continuously matriculate is phenomenal. I think what you'll find in today's conversation and beyond is just how important uh, this dialogue is to have, of course, to continue to have as it relates to our presence within mass media. Uh, I also want you to know our, we've separated this. You guys are actually going to get two panels in one session. Uh, so we have this panel that's going to start now, uh, and we've like some esteemed leaders. Then we're going to transition, so you guys sit still, do not leave. Uh, we're bringing in some 20th Century Fox uh, personalities from the film, uh, The Hate You Give, and they're going to come in, and we're going to have another conversation uh, still around media diversity, which I'm sure you will enjoy. So let me uh, start off by introducing our panelists. And like I said, we're going to move fast into our conversation. So I want to start with my friend and, per and a good person uh, who has been in the industry for a number of years, an award-winning content and branding expert, Amy DuBois Barnett, has held senior leadership positions at ESPN, Ebony, Harper's Bazaar, Teen Magazine, Essence, and Honey Magazine. Uh, she is currently the Chief Content Officer for The Grio, the leading digital media brand, and, uh, and serves uh, for the services of the African American audience. She is also the EVP uh, of Digital for Byron Allen's Entertainment Studios, and Amy is the author of an empowered advice book for women, Get Yours, How to Have Everything You've Ever Dreamed, uh, and more. Can you please welcome Amy? Next up, I want to introduce Mr. Zaire McGee. Zaire McGee is the co-creator and executive producer of Scandal at ABC Studios. He was born and raised in South Jersey, uh, buried in the shadows of, of Philadelphia. Zaire realized at a young age that the next best thing to being the sixth Cosby kid was to write for the television show. After graduating from the University of Maryland with a Bachelor's of Arts in Government and Politics, I want to keep them on, on your short list. Zaire worked as a mortgage guy. How about that? A decorated writer and a, and a director of short films, Zaire graduated with distinction from the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts with, and with a MFA uh, in writing for screen television, where he has held his prestigious Ainsberg, and Ainsberg Fellowship. Zaire has written for ABC's Private Practice, Scandal, and For the People. Please welcome Zaire. <laughs> Let me now introduce Tahira Good. She's with uh, Netflix in their original film space. Tahira Good is a development and production executive on the original film team at Netflix, where she's currently in pre-production on two films slated to start production this fall and is imposed on several films and features, including the Eddie Murphy comedy based on the life of the comedian Rudy Ray Moore. Some of us in this room know Rudy Ray Moore. Some of you in this room do not know Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, you will learn about Rudy Ray Moore from Eddie Murphy. Believe that. Um, so, as well as a romantic comedy with Ali Wong and uh, Randall Park, uh, and of course a, a family adventure movie produced by Christopher Columbus titled The Christmas Chronicles, which is slated to launch on Netflix uh, this holiday season. Prior to Netflix, Tahira was, was Director of Development at Lava Bear Films, where she worked on features such as Arrival, The Force, Shut In, Tara earned an MFA in film production from the prestigious a Peter Stark produ producing program at USC in 2007. Uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Foster Driver. Foster is the Vice President of Production at Walt Disney Studios Motion Pictures. Vice President uh, Foster, uh, he joined Disney in 2014, where he has helped to shepherd the development and production of films such as Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Lie, which, gross has, which has grossed over $800 million globally, The Lion King, Jungle Cruise, starring Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt, and Tim Burton's Dumbo. Prior to joining Disney, Foster spent two years working as a creative executive at uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment, and prior to that, he worked as an assistant at Warner Brothers 
pictures during the production of such films as The Dark Knight, uh, Rises, Man of Steel, The Lego Movie, Mad Max Fury Road, Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise. He's a native of Los Angeles, born and raised in South Central, LA. <laughs> studied telecommunications production and multimedia design at Pepperdine University. Uh, he went on to intern, intern at Jerry Bruckenberg Television before landing his full-time job at w William Morris Agency. Please welcome Foster Driver. <laughs> Next we have something special and she's actually gonna come to the mic uh, and provide some introduction first and some dialogue first when she steps on the stage. Uh, this is going to be Grace Kelly. She is the SVP. Uh, did I say Grace Kelly? Yeah. <laughs> I <call her> Grace. <laughs> That's how phenomenal she is. Everybody was like, Grace Kelly is <laughs> Shell Grace, the SVP of U.S. Strategic Community Alliances and Consumer Engagement for Nielsen. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> now, let, let me tell you, uh, Shell Grace. In our business of marketing and advertising, her work, and I didn't share this with her yet, so I'm glad to do it from the stage. Her work is instrumental. Uh, I've run my agency for 17 years now. I have every report she has ever put out and her office has ever published. It's critical information that, interesting enough, it shapes how we do business. So I'm gonna tell just a little bit about her background, but I want you to understand the information she's giving you is critical. So if you're in the business, if you want to be in the business, I advise you to pull out a pen and a paper. This is your time to take some notes because the things that she says, trust me, they will help you in your business moving forward and your career. Cheryl Grace is the Senior Vice President, like I mentioned, of uh, uh, Vice President of Strategic Community Alliances and Consumer Engagement for Nielsen, the global company that measures what consumers watch and what consumers buy. She is highly accomplished thought leader and a visionary behind Nielsen's African American Consumer Report. If you don't have that report, go get it. The award-winning report led to the company's historic creation of Nielsen's Diversity Insight Series, a series of reports focusing on the rapid growth of the multicultural consumer base. Each report is specific in either the African American, the Hispanic, or the Asian community, known for her engaging and refreshing perspective about how, uh, around why we buy and what we buy. Cheryl is a much sought after speaker. Please give her another round of applause as she comes to the mic to provide us some great information. Hello, my name is Matt Grace Kelly. <laughs> I am Cheryl Grace. And I'm here today to share with you a little secret about Hollywood. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Okay, so come on. Hollywood doesn't see black or brown. Hollywood sees green, right? And so as consumers who happen to be black and brown, we really are one of the cornerstones of demographic groups that Hollywood is just now beginning to recognize our value and our importance. So when you see a movie such as Black Panther do phenomenally domestically and not just domestically but globally as well because the running storyline has always been that black movies don't sell well overseas. And so Black Panther came along and shattered all of those myths. It is the third highest ranking revenue movie in the United States ever, ever, ever. And so when Hollywood starts to recognize that when a positive story about black and brown people can shatter shatter all the myths that we've heard before, then what they are willing to do is they are willing to invest their time and their money. And the reason this is one of the best kept secrets is because y'all keep buying whatever they push out at you. Blacks watch more television than any other group of people. We listen to more radio than any other group of people. How many of you in the room are older than the age of 13? <laughs> okay, 
73% of black people over the age of 13 claim to be video gamers. Some of you all may be in the closet with it. <laughs> Some of you all just don't care. You got your little consoles out wherever you go. But video gaming is a $36 billion a year industry. And 73% of us are playing those games. You compare that to what box office are delivering in Hollywood, which is about $11 billion a year in box office revenues. And you can start to see that if 73% of us are engaging in an activity that really matters to us, the important aspect of how we move from voracious consumers to step into owning our power is becoming voracious content providers. Because if 73% of us, and that's like 31 million of us as African Americans, there are only 47 million of us here, right? If they start to recognize that there's money to be had in diversifying the stories that you are playing on those games, because you want to see yourself in the games, how long do you think before they start easing over from Hollywood into the gaming industry and merging those industries? Because right now, the lines are really very blurred between industries. You're seeing that more and more as you go along. And so the report that Nielsen released yesterday is specifically on digital lifestyles of African Americans and how we are le leading and setting all the trends and breaking all the records digitally. The opportunity that we have with our $1.3 trillion of buying power, let me say that again, $1.3 trillion of buying power, the opportunity that we have here is to totally leverage this level, the playing field, if we create our own content and tell our stories about ourselves in all of the multi-dimensionalities that we own and how we want to see ourselves. And so that's why this panel and the panel that you're going to hear with the creative folks, that's why Hollywood is so important for you to understand your power that you bring to the table. You have a hundred and, I'm sorry, you have $1.3 trillion of buying power right now. That's going to be $1.5 trillion by 2022. And your money, you're spending it faster than any other demographic group of people. Our spending patterns and habits went up 108% compared to 87% of everybody else, general market. So yes, I know I get critics that say all the time, yikes, we should be investing that money. That's that panel over there. So if you want to hear that discussion, I'm just telling you what we're doing right now. And as long as you're spending it, you probably should be spending it on something and someone and products and brands that respect you, look like you, and treat you like you need to be treated. Thank you. Now, here's what I want to advise you to do. Um, be sure to download that report. Again, um, regardless what line of business, if you're a creative, if you're a media executive, uh, on our corporate side, I know we have some corporate executives in the room, uh, I spend uh, so much of my time taking those reports into the different studios and networks and just having conversations based on what has been provided to help justify my position. So sometimes having these Nielsen reports allows you an edge of conversation because you can point to the source and reference versus just what you're saying. So make sure you grab that report. Uh, as was brought up, uh, Black Panther did a phenomenal job at the box office. I, was, I had the pleasure of working on that campaign. And so we're gonna start Foster with a conversation about Black Panther and its overall impact because the one thing, uh, so some years ago, maybe, you guys remember Maleficent, the film? 
And I remember going to the studio and talking, this is at Walt Disney, and I talked to some of the marketing executives, and these are the marketing executives of color, and everyone was kind of ho-hum because they didn't really see on the forefront this area of diversity really taking hold across the studio in the broad fashion that they hold. And it was so interesting to me, we created what was called an African American Brain Trust. I was the only non-Disney employee I'm the only non-Disney person to sit on that. And one of the major points of reference was the change has to start at the casting level. You have to see images. You have to cast the right people to even bring writing, to bring perspective, to bring stories to life. And then fast forward, after a number of films, you get to a Black Panther, which creates an explosion and a realization. So Foster, I'd like you to spend a minute in, from your production perspective and talk about what you have seen over your period at Disney and how that has translated time and time again to now I think an increased platform where diversity is not just a, uh, a dialogue, it is the conversation uh, on the lot. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's interesting uh, that you bring up the point about sort of starting with casting and sort of showing people faces that look like them, voices that are similar to their voices and perspectives that they can relate to. And, you know, we often have that debate internally. It's, it's do you want actors who are diverse first? Or do you want the writers? Or is it the producers or the directors? And the thing that I'm always saying to people is the most important thing to do when you're thinking about starting is to just start. start. <laughs> That's half the battle right there. Whether it's an actor on screen that you see that reminds you of you, that lets you know that, hey, you can aspire to more. You can be greater, you can do greater. Or whether it's the director or the producer or the executive behind the camera who is in charge of the decision to cast that actor. You know, that's one of the things that, uh, that is often sort of overlooked is who are those decision makers, who are those people with the green light power to sort of make a Black Panther. You know, you can come up with the idea, but you gotta go pitch it to somebody. And if that person doesn't have the knowledge, or the insight, or the ability to say, hey, I believe in that person, or I believe in that voice, then a Black Panther doesn't happen. And we've been fortunate at the Walt Disney Company because in recent years, uh, we have seen a lot of upward trends, you know? You talk about having a Maleficent, and I'll say since we released Maleficent in 2014, I believe, um, we have since made movies like Queen of Kotwe with Mira Nair directing, uh, a very authentic film about Uganda that showed an atmosphere that was real, that was an impoverished village. Um, however, it wasn't hopeless. It was very optimistic. And that was something that was very important to us. It's, it's not just seeing black people or brown people or, or Asian people or, or any person um, in traditional, cliched, stereotypical roles. It's not saying, oh, you know, we're going to show you a fantasy in a world that doesn't reflect your own world. Um, we're going to show your world, and we're going to try to show it as authentically as possible by finding people who know that experience, um, who've lived that experience to tell that story. Um, but in addition to that, we're also going to tell you that, hey, even if this is your world now, there's still hope, there's still optimism, there's still more, there's still more you can achieve. And so moving from Queen of Katwe to McFarland, USA, the story about the Mexican-American immigrants who lived in McFarland, California, and who went on to become one of the best uh, long-distance high school running teams in our nation's history, um, up to and including A Wrinkle in Time recently and Black Panther, um, you're starting to see us hire not only more diverse actors, but more diverse directors, more diverse writers, more diverse creators who are going to be those voices in those rooms that we can't always be in. You know, um, I think that Disney has come a long way and we still have more room to grow, just like everybody in Hollywood and everybody in the industry. But with Black Panther, um, exactly as you were saying, it is proof positive that it's not just the right moral decision, but it's the right business decision. And these movies can make money. And I'll tell you, 
Black Panther doesn't make $1.3 billion if only brown faces go and see that movie. Everybody had to go see that movie for it to become the phenomenon that it is. And that's really what we try to do, is we try to open up the conversation to say, hey, just because there's a black or brown face in front of the camera or behind the camera, doesn't mean those stories are just for black or brown people. Those stories are for everybody, and everybody should feel invited. Absolutely. Let me move across the street from uh, the studio, and we're gonna go to ABC. And because we have the co-creator of Scandal here, I I, I did not co-create Scandal. <laughs> I worked on it for a very long time, and I'm happy to, but it's fully and completely created by Shonda Rhimes. There it is. And the one thing about Shonda, thank you, as I watch this title, yeah. right? Shonda uh, brought diversity in a dynamic way across all of her content, and it was consistent. And uh, one of the things that is interesting with our studios and television networks is they have, some of them have been reluctant to publicly commit to gender diversity, uh, to greater diversity, as well as to inclusion. And uh, much less have they been reluctant to stay accountable. But some of our creators have made it a very pressing point to stay on that path. So Zaire, I want you to talk about your process and what you guys have gone through as you've maintained a very high level of diversity to across ABC with a number of different shows uh, and what that kind of forecast looks in the future uh, is things are now shifting and changing, but you are now in the mix. Uh, yeah, well, I will say that um, I'm, I've been very fortunate uh, because I went to Hollywood and I worked for a black woman straight away and that's the only person I've worked for. Uh, and just looking at the shows that I've worked on, so it started out, um, I was actually a Disney fellow through a uh, diversity program they have at ABC where they pick eight people, um, they find uh, talented voices, they select eight people, you go through this rigorous process, and then what they're able to do is offer you kind of as a discount to the show. So they can say, we're already paying them, so why don't you try them out, see if it works out. So that's a program that helps you get into the room. And so I got into the room at Private Practice, which was the first show I worked on, which was a Shonda show. Um, and just talking about the two different shows and how maybe her view of diversity or how those shoot, two, two shows looked. Grey's Anatomy and Private Practice are shows where there were gay doctors, there were black doctors, there were Hispanic doctors, and we didn't talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like a, a huge thing about race or class. It was just, yeah, we got doctors, and they all went to Harvard and Yale and whatever, you know? So that was a different level of diversity, and then Scandal brought something different in which we, you know, talked more explicitly about race and we were able to, and that changed the landscape in terms of casting, which we were talking about before because, you know, when Kerry became Olivia Pope, that was the first time in almost four decades that a black woman had, was gonna be the lead of a, a network TV show. So uh, it's changing and I think that now you're seeing more faces and more people of color and more women of color on television and that's because also the television is becoming more popular and there's more opportunities for people. You know, we're gonna have more shows this year than we've ever had and next year I'm sure we'll have more shows than we've ever had before that. So there's opportunity. Um, all that said, behind the scenes I can say working in a writer's room other than 13 episodes, I've always been the only black guy in the room. So um, part of it is, you know, uh, the, in front of the camera you can change things, but also, you know, when you have people behind the camera or in the writer's room who are casting their particular episodes, they're able to look at a role and see, well, it's not just assumed whiteness. It's not just assumed that if this person wasn't identified as black, um, that that's gonna be a white person. Um, so as long as we get more people behind the scenes and the number of writers increase, we can have more inclusion in writer's rooms, I think you're gonna see more shows uh, like Scandal. Um, and because those shows like Black Panther are also quite profitable, you know, people wanna see them. Fantastic. Now I'm gonna move down the street to a little other part of, uh, of LA to Netflix, where now Shonda Rhimes, Kenya Barris, as well as Tindo Naganda, uh, have all made residents. Um, and to hear, I'd really like to go into the creative conversation. And, and you know, as Netflix has blossomed uh, dramatically and drastically over the last uh, few years, um, we've seen more and more 
quality of diversity come in play, and I think that that's going to continue, obviously, with the creators you guys have in place. Uh, can you talk to us about having that level of diverse talent on the roster and what you feel it's going to ultimately deliver to the overall landscape of Netflix? Sure. I mean, I think uh, having that level of diverse talent, first of all, is amazing. You know, I've never worked for a company where you know, there is such top-tier um, creators of color all under one roof. And I think, you know, for Netflix, it starts with the premise that we're a global company and our audience is diverse and that the content we produce should reflect our, our audience. And we are in the business of giving our audience what they want, and that's content that looks like us. And we don't start with the premise that you know people of color don't travel, um, because as we know, there are people of color all over the world, and that there is not just one monolith idea of what it means to be black or what it means to be you know Asian. So um, starting you know erasing those sort of um, beliefs that have like permeated Hollywood for you know the last hundred years is sort of what Netflix stands on and you know the ability to bring on these creators to help us you know achieve those goals of bringing even more diverse content um, to our audience is amazing. Um, so I think in the future you'll see you know even more content coming your way that um, uh, you can enjoy both on the film and the series side, but also, you know, in our docs and comedies and our stand up. Um, as you can see, you know, we're definitely leaning into not just domestic, but internationally. So if you're somebody who loves, you know, South African comedians, you can go and see South African comedians or comedians from like India, you can go and see um, comedians from India. So it's, it's a really, really fantastic landscape out there and it will only continue to grow. Fantastic. So I'm going to change gears now about ownership. Um, and Amy, one of the great things is whether it was at Ebony uh, or now with Byron Allen and Entertainment Studios, you've had the pleasure of working with uh, cultural and African-American owners at the highest level. And these are owners that are doing dramatic things that change our overall cultural experience, whether it's in print, whether it's in digital, uh, whether it's television. Uh, so you've seen it across the multitude of media landscapes. I really want to, but we all know that, and we can say this from a spin perspective, we constantly see the numbers shrinking. It gets, it gets thinner, thinner, thinner. And sometimes the tough thing is having the level of support to maintain your overall position in that marketplace. The GRIO, I remember when the GRIO launched. And I was actually the agency director for NBC Universal, so I remember there was tremendous energy. But at that time, there were a number of different platforms, whether it was the Root or you know, a number of other websites that we could go to from, with different publishers. Now, even in the growth of the digital space, I've seen a shrink. And I've seen this night tighter and tighter focus where I'm glad that Blavity and a few other folks are now coming on board. But these landscapes, they still require deep levels of support from us, from the marketing media, from uh, the consumer base. So I want to talk from the ownership and with you and Byron Allen and the GRIO. How did, what can we do to really infuse a stronger, tighter network to help our platform survive, to not just survive, but flourish? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I'm so happy. I was really worried that Monique was going to tear you down. I just, you know, I'm kidding, you guys. <laughs> Who was worried? Nobody. <laughs> anyway, um, and I've also experienced um, black ownership at Honey Magazine, just yeah. for the record, um, which was owned by Vanguard Media. Um, and that was my first time um, running a media brand that was black owned. Um, and I, I can say, just for context, that there is a tremendous difference um, when you are um, working for uh, somebody who shares your overarching perspective. You know, that, that's really very meaningful. Um, you know, when I first, when I left Ebony and I moved to LA for the first time, I, I, um, I was actually uh, working with Disney and um, at ESPN helping them launch The Undefeated. And it was just, I'm saying this because it's just for, you know, for, for, uh, for contrast. As I was 
working with the team to put together the thinking behind that brand and what we're going to cover and whatever, the, the shadow of the mouse ears, right, was like all over everything that we were doing. And there were so many parameters around, um, well, should we be talking about this? And is, you know, is this too, you know, um, far left? And is this going to be too incendiary? And how does this reflect on the overarching brand? And it, you know, just to be honest, it was very constricting. Um, so again, when you're able to um, you know, work with a, uh, a executive leadership um, board that shares your perspective, you know, you're, you're able to reflect your perspective more. I mean, bottom line, you know. Um, you know, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us, you know, as Cheryl was saying, as Grace Kelly was saying over there. Looking how fabulous, I love this whole thing. Y'all need to understand, I, I was telling everybody in the back, but she is the foremost expert on black consumers in this country. It's real, like this woman right there. Anyway, um, but as she was saying, you know, it's, um, you know, it's very important that we're conscious of ourselves as consumers, right? And so it's incumbent upon all of us to think of ourselves as consumers and um, to understand the things that we are therefore consuming, right? So I guess to your question, um, I mean, I'm not sure actually how we can rally more behind our brand other than to be conscious, other than to really understand what are the things that we're consuming that actually reflect us from an authentic perspective, right? But I, I mean, I don't know, I kind of think that we do that intrinsically. You know, I think that we are a people, we black folks are a people that feel authenticity in our guts, right? And um, and if we are not being given content, because it's true, we do consume content that isn't authentic. We kind of, I mean, we also like pop culture, right? We like culture, we like, we're just, you know, we're out there in the world, so we do consume all that content too. But when it comes to our perspective, if things that are supposed to be about us and for us do not come with authenticity in place, I think we know it, you know? So, um, I don't know, I think that we just need to continue to honor that feeling and, and you know, understand um, who's really got our back, right? Who are the media brands, you know, who are the entertainment companies that truly have our back, and continue to support those. Support really does matter. Um, I think the more you place an emphasis on where and what you consume and you're conscious about it, it, ch it can help change the landscape. Then it's up to, for others to begin to help that communication get pushed out so that our decisions are better. Uh, we call it the business intelligence uh, and kind of the space that we share, Cheryl. Um, this is an open question for our panel. Uh, so Warner Media, you may, some of you may be aware, recently announced and unveiled some diversity protocols for movies and television. It was a, uh, I think a very dramatic and, and big announcement that they make, made about what they're trying to do as it relates to these protocols. Uh, what it includes are workshops for emerging directors and writers. You're going to have uh, some opportunities for training for technicians, um, and they say they're going to have they're going to put forth their best effort to use diverse uh, crew members as well to really increase the overall landscape of diversity across the, the Warner Media platforms, which include HBO and CNN and others. Um, I, I I love the fact that we you know when something like this comes up and they're able to announce it. From your perspective, how do we take full advantage of it, and how do we, you know, impress upon young people and others to say, "Go after this"? And then, two, I'm going to transition after that, if you can. How do we take it into this, what I call part two, which is into the boardroom and the executive decision making, where the green lighting actually happens? Well, I I have to say that diversity is built into the bedrock of. Um, what Netflix is all about. It's literally written into the culture memo that we that forms the foundation of Netflix as a company. So we always start from, you know, a position of um, diversity. So that means, you know, are we looking for diverse content? Are we looking at um, diverse crew? Are we looking for um, diverse cast? And you know, there is work to be done and we are doing um, the work internally as well. So there are certain um, initiatives and programs that we are 
doing internally to help sort of promote more diversity and inclusion um, that we may not be, you know, blasting it out there, but it is, um, it is being done, and it's being done by each and every uh, Netflix employee. Um, if I'm, um, you know, looking at diverse crew base to, you know, giving opportunities and access to um, creators to write those stories that we are all sort of craving for. So I think, you know, like you said, supporting those um, that those content that really um, speaks to you and like brings that authenticity is super important. Um, so I think that it's um, you know it's something that we at Netflix definitely feel and feel that it's it's important. And I think you know the second part of your question about green light power, um, not to do like Netflix is porn, and again you know we're always doing the work, but it is. You know, something where uh, we have a sense of like freedom and responsibility, where it's up to like every employee on the content side to really be able to um, advocate and um, you know bring about the projects that they're passionate about. And you know, one of those things, like I said, is our diverse projects, both globally and you know domestically. Zaire, I want you to chime in on this because I'm really, I want to go a little deeper because I do see some young faces in the audience. What I hear all the time in my office is that, hey, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm an actor, but I, I need to figure out how to get in. And you went through a program that helped you get in. And when a company makes an announcement like this, like Warner Media, and for example, I know in the audience there's a young lady that would not want me to call her name, but I'm gonna call it. There's Karen Horn from NBC Universal, and she has some of the most dynamic programs to help infuse and bring in diverse talent. I called your name, Karen. Uh, <laughs> is when you have these programs, you make these announcements. I want people to take advantage of it. You have to flood the system to say, "Hey, you guys said it. We want to get it." So we're not the only person in the writers' room. Well, for I, Karen, I, the NBC Universal Diversity Program is about the only one I didn't do. I, <laughs> I did them all. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I didn't think I was going to have a lot to say on this matter at all. But first of all, the answer to the protocols and all that's fantastic. But a lot of times, if you don't, to certain people, that just means meeting a certain number. Right. We're, we're aiming to do this thing, or we have to do it. Um, but when you have a creator, um, which is sort of, in terms of the writers, the TV side of things, they are kind of the end all and be all. They make the decisions, you know, they're going to hire the crew, they're going to put the, you know, any edict in place about the number of crew members. I think changing that and making it so that we have more creators and more people who've worked in television long enough that when they're looking for a showrunner to take over a show to basically be the head producer, they can make all those decisions about finding a DP of color and it will be important to them versus just do I have some lists from somewhere because I know I have to look at this person or that person. So as we grow and there are more voices that are able to break in through some of these diversity programs, those people need to continue to work and we need to champion them going forward so that they can move and rise the ranks so that they can become co-executive producers and start creating their own shows and they have the experience that they can run them because then those protocols won't even matter because I'm just going to hire the best people and people who look like me and I want my crew to be um, you know, a microcosm of the world and I think that's uh, a fair thing. Now in terms of breaking in, I was fortunate, you know, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey which is, you know, it's a totally great place to me, but I say that to people sometimes and they're like, it's rough. And I remember Time Magazine had a cover when I was a kid that said, this is the worst city in America. And it's a cesspool. And I'm like, well, I live here and it's pretty cool. And I, <laughs> I'm doing okay. And my parents went to high school here. And, you know, so, and I didn't know that you could make movies. I knew I loved movies. I knew my dad loved movies. But then my dad let me go see whatever I wanted, I think, because he didn't want to go see bad movies. So in the early 90s, you had, you know, Boys in the Hood, New Jack City, New Jersey Drive, uh, Menace to Society, which were these movies created by black people. And said, so I said, oh, I can do this. And so anytime I'm talking to people, I say you just got to do it. And I don't mean do it like you're immediately going to get put on and do TV, but know that you have a unique voice and a unique vision. And don't be discouraged by things like, well, I don't have software to do this or that. That is discouraging, but the reality is, People who grow up come from different places who don't know anything about Hollywood 
can bring the most unique voices to Hollywood. Um, and so, you know, it's hard, and it's hard even if you have connections. So, I'm not saying it's easy, but the first thing is just to do it. And no one can stop yeah. you from writing something. And now no one can stop you from shooting something. These phones are crazy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I had to beg my parents to get a camcorder when I was like 20, it was huge, and like, I had one tape, and I kept doing it over and over to make some dumb yeah. movie. <laughs> now you can shoot whatever you want, yeah. so just do it. And you can post it, you can post stuff, right? Yeah. Just put it on YouTube, yeah. and like, you have a breadth of material mm -hmm. and stuff. So, um, people are looking for yeah. you. So just yeah. do it. Yeah, and I have to give a love to the executive side because we need more people of color in those green lit, green lighting positions um, who can give those opportunities to um, creators of color um, because the you know just doing it yes, but you also need you know people who will give you the money to do it eventually you know for those bigger landscape uh, projects. So um, knowing that there is that pathway um, just coming out to Hollywood, meet people left, right, and center, cold call people, you know, and just get in their faces as much as possible, respectfully. Um, uh, but I didn't have any connections coming out here, and like I just took every internship that I possibly could and just leveraged it up and leveraged it up and learned as much as I could um, until I got where, where, where I am today. And I, I think the just doing it aspect of it is one of the reasons that Nielsen focused on the digital lives of blacks this year is because we saw so much of the consumption happening digitally and we recognize how you also want to see yourselves reflected. And so this year, the report is a little bit different in that we don't just talk about the consumption, but we also talk about the importance of becoming content creators and just doing it, like you said. So um, you can download a copy of the report at Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N.com backslash um, African Americans with an S on the end. And I just want to say a couple of words about the type of stories that we tell, um, both in Hollywood and also um, um, you know, in, in all forms of media, basically, in journalism and in, in you know, you know, narrative forms and in all forms. Um, I've had a very anomalous career for a black person um, in that I have um, worked for both black and urban media brands and also um, mainstream media brands. Um, you know, I have, I have, you know, I'm not sure, I missed my snazzy introduction, so I don't know how much of this you went over, but, um, but you know, I, I did work for, or I, I ran team people, um, and I was also number two at Harper's Bazaar, and then also worked for these, these uh, uh, black and urban um, brands as well. It is unfortunate, it is, it is a source of pain for me, frankly, that I am so rare in my industry. I should not be so rare. More people of color should get opportunities to tell all stories, right? And I think that part of the issue is that, part of the challenge, I guess, is that we get pigeonholed. People assume that we, people of color, black folks, can only tell our stories, right? And we may want to only tell our stories, which is totally fine. Um, but we may also want to tell other stories. We may also want to, you know, talk about, you know, a retelling of a Greek myth. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Or wrinkle in time. Or wrinkle in time, exactly. Or whatever it is, um, you know, there is, a, there is a diversity of stories that we are able to tell. And so I just want to um, encourage all of us to, 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 honor whatever stories it is that you want to tell, bottom line. Tell our stories, yes, absolutely, please tell our stories, but tell whatever the hell stories you want to tell yeah. also. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. As we go into our changeover, can you please give our panel a round of applause? <laughs> While, while you guys are applauding, I also want to announce that Angie Gates, the director of the DC Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, is here. We want to recognize you.
So uh, we're going to have a quick changeover at this moment. They're going to prep a, a real, we're going to continue this conversation in media diversity, which I think is going to go even deeper and even further into some greater spaces. Uh, and so sit tight. Um, I want to take a second and make sure that we also introduce Yep. So sit tight. We're going to change it over very quickly, like I mentioned. Now, when it happens, don't act bad. You gotta look calm. Now, one day, y'all gonna be with me, and you best bet we're gonna get pulled over. It can get real dangerous, so don't argue with them. You're gonna see me with my hands like this on the dashboard. Keep your hands where they can see them. This how you and I. Don't you ever forget that being black is an honor because you come from greatness. You understand? I was nine years old when I first got the top. My name is Star. Two R's. Daddy named me that. Garden Heights. Mama and Daddy says our life is here because our people are here. We got Mr. Rubens Barbecue, Mr. Lewis's Barbershop and Daddy store. The high school is where you go to get jump, high, or break more. We don't go there. Garden Heights is one world. Williamson is another. So when I'm here, I'm star version two. Hey, boo. Hey, how are you? Yo, those kids are lit. Basically, Williamson star doesn't give anyone a reason to call her ghetto. And I hate myself for doing it. Until the weekend comes around. I get those goosebumps every time. What's up? School, basketball, keeping busy. Nah, I know you be hanging with all white kids. Man, you coming at me for my music, but you listen to this old stuff. Oh, stuff. Like, let's get up out of here with all that pockets. It's true.
fantastic. We have, uh, again, our next panel is so fabulous. So I want you guys to get excited and get ready because I'm introducing Regina Hall, who is DC's finest. <laughs> Regina most recently starred in the hit comedy Girls Trip, which was uh, produced by my good friend, Mr. Will Packer. She is born and raised in Washington, D.C. Give it up. Give her some more. She made her television debut in 1992, where she appeared on the ABC soap opera Loving, work proved to be uh, sporadic. <laughs> uh, with several years passing before she landed another project, but the time uh, this time on New York Undercover. For us that know New York Undercover was... Man, he really hated me, y'all. That They're was like, it. There's somebody here going, what's New York it. Undercover? <laughs> After playing Candy, a stripper on the feature of The Best Man. <laughs> right? Yes. Rose began to come her way very frequently. She starred in Love and Basketball. Who remembers Love and Basketball? <laughs> and Scary Movie. After which followed the Scary Movie sequels the three episode arc of a junior associate uh, on Robert Downey's character of, on Ally McBeal in the spring of 2001 oh, yeah. led to her becoming a season regular in 2001 and 2002. When that gig ended, Regina moved back into feature films with roles on Malibu's Most Wanted, opposite Jamie Kennedy, King's Ransom, with uh, my good friend Anthony Anderson, uh, as well as some of the films, I know you're going to remember these, Death at a Funeral, Think Like a Man, Think Like a Man 2, Barbershop, The Next Cut, When the Burrow Breaks, great film, and then as I mentioned earlier, Girls Trip. Here's Thank you. And here's something that I found. Regina's been like, she's like 79 out here. And, uh, here's something that really, really jumped out at me. She also earned her master's degree in journalism in 1997 from New York University. All right. Next, I want to bring up the gentleman, Russell Hornsby. I've had the pleasure. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I've had the pleasure of working with Russell, but he has amassed a catalog of film and television. Russell has worked on some of the best uh, qualified, the best highly rated content on television and film. Uh, from Fences, who remember Fences? <laughs> He's also coming forward here in Creed 2. I know you're getting ready for that. I, was, I had the pleasure of working with Russell on uh, the smash hit, NBC smash hit, Grimm. <laughs> Many of you were introduced to him, or you really kept track of him on ABC's Lincoln Heights, yeah! as well as HBO's In Treatment. So he's born and raised in Oakland, California. Hornsby was in the theater program at Boston University. He studied for a summer at the British Academy of Dramatic Arts. I he graduated Oxford. Oxford. <laughs> Oxford University. Hornsby currently resides in Los Angeles with his family. All right. My black wife. <laughs> That's right. Call That's one right. time. <laughs> Sister. Next up, I have the pleasure to introduce a Rattler. And I'm saying that strong because there's some other Rattlers in the room. No hate, we love you, Howard, but Rattlers are everywhere. This is common. Come on now. Hip hop's finest. Common, who's now, of course, he's an actor, he's an activist, a film producer, a poet from Chicago, Chi-Town, where you at? Common debuted in 1992, that's what it says on the paper, but for us that remember, Common was down at FAMU, on the set, giving it to him. So we know a different level of Common. But in 1994, Common dropped something that many of us consider just ultimate classic was, I used to love her. Right? Come on now. 2011, Common launched Think Common Entertainment, his own uh, record label imprint. And in the past, he has released music under various other labels, whether well it's Relativity, uh, Geffen, Good Music, among others. Uh, his major label debut was Like Water for Chocolate. Come on, who got that? Come on now. Thank you. It was 
received widespread critical acclaim as well as commercial success. His first Grammy Award was in 2003, winning Best R&B Song for Love of My Life with Erica Badu. I can hear it playing in my ears. Sing it. You know, you're not gonna have that. You ain't gonna have that. We ain't gonna do that. Also, uh, he had, in 2005, B, which was nominated for Best Hip Hop, uh, Best Rap Album, at the 2006 Grammy Awards, Common was awarded his second Grammy for Best Rap Performance and Duo uh, for a, or Group for Southside featuring Con Kanye West from his uh, J July 2007 album, Finding Forever. Again, the great thing is his ability to transition and move between different space and com com spaces. Common won in 2015 the Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song and in 2015, the Academy Award for Best Original Song for his song, Glory, from the 2014 film, Selma. Let's give it up for Tom. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> we have another superstar in her own right. I've known her for a long time. I'm from ATL. I want you guys to give it up for Winsome Sinclair. Winston Sinclair is a very well-known acclaimed casting director, has collaborated with Steven Spielberg, Spike Lee, Oliver Stone, John Singleton, Lee Daniels. Us that are in the industry, we know she has brought some of the best. And then when, when I tell you these films, whoo, Amistad, Malcolm X, Waiting to Excel, The Best Man, Inside Man, Too Fast, Too Furious, Black Snakes, Moan, Cadillac Records, Sparkle, and Precious. Many other films have been a credit to Winston Sinclair. She's also stepped into the documentary space. I know, of course, we've been working closely uh, linked together with Maynard, which is the film of, uh, of course, our famous Atlanta mayor. Uh, in 2015, she completed Barbershop with Malcolm Lee. Uh, 2016, she completed the principal casting for films such as All Eyes on Me uh, for the Tupac Shakur biopic. Again, give it up for Winston Sinclair. So, um, you guys just saw a clip of their upcoming film, The Hate You Give. I can tell you, I've seen the film. It is one of the most powerful layered films I've seen. I've, I've worked on 30 number one films, five Academy films, 150 other films that have grossed $3 billion. When I see a film, I know when a film is going to hit. Trust me. The hate you give is going to explode, right? Yes. And you guys have the opportunity today to be with their principal cast. Now, we're going to have a dynamic day with them. Um, this particular conversation is going to be on media diversity, but we're also going to have a special forum uh, between 3 and 5 o'clock, where we're also going to talk about specifically the hate you give. We're going to deep dive into that. Uh, so, and then there's, uh, there's more. There's going to be a reception. There's other things going on, even a screening. Some of you have tickets to the screening. Some of you don't. Sorry. Catch it when it comes to the box office. That's how it works. This particular conversation is going to be around media diversity. And where I want to start, I ended talking about Warner Media and what they announced as far as some protocols regarding, regarding diversity in, in movies and television. The first person to really announce something very specific was Michael B. Jordan and his production company, which says, hey, uh, I'm going to go out and put in an inclusion rider, and I'm going to make it known that projects that I'm associated with, there's going to need to be some parameters around my participation or my company's participation, which I think was phenomenal. As you know, he just started production on a film uh, in Atlanta. And so I want to talk to our cast members, and anyone can answer this, um, around these diversity as well as inclusion writers. It's, a, it's, it's been an interesting topic for a while. And let me explain, again, for those that don't understand. Uh, as principal talent, you also have a certain level of positioning and power. Uh, at the same time, it's a delicate balance because there's always levels of competition. But when you state a platform that you sit on and engagement, it also helps establish kind of how people will work with you. Remember, you sometimes you have to treat people how you want to be treated. Am I right? And so Michael B. Jordan made a quick stance after his success with Creed, after Black Panther. He basically said, I'm going to teach you how to treat me with this particular protocol. So as we look at that from a creative and from an actor and actress's perspective, 
how does that translate and how do you guys see not only what Michael B. Jordan has done, but just this progression that we're having with the conversation of inclusion and diversity in Hollywood? Well, first of all, I, I definitely commend Michael for doing that. And that's, that's leadership right there. That, that takes um, the courage that we need to, 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 ch to change the landscape that we know has existed in not only in film and, and entertainment and media, but just in America, like, you know, where we don't have black men and women represented in the way that they should be, in the way that we should be. Um, I do have to say is I've been around sets where, like per se Selma, where that wasn't in the, in the writer, but it was in the action. Like, when I walked on the set of Selma, the head of costume was black, like, the head of makeup was black, and it was women like running things, and 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 I and I have to acknowledge I heard Spike Lee has done a lot of the same type of things with his films. So the fact that that Michael B is like taking it and advancing it by saying, "Look, this is in the contract that it has to be." I mean, that's the those are the steps that we take, um, not only as actors, but he's a producer that we take to really change the landscape, and then it becomes part of the norm. And we won't, we won't have to have that conversation anymore. Exactly. Exactly. For, for those that don't quite even get it even further, let me explain. I'm going to give you a correlation. So in the NFL, 90% of the people on the field are what? Up until some years ago, there were very few even on the coaching staff. But the NFL had to put in a contract like this that said we have to interview NFL teams have to interview diverse candidates for coaching. And that helped change the landscape for coaching. You understand? The next layer is with ownership. So the key here sometimes is making sure, although sometimes people get afraid saying, well, it doesn't have to be contractual. Can it just be a conversation, something that we agree upon? Sometimes you got to put it on paper for people to really make some decision to make some things happen. Winsome, I know that in our space, and from a casting perspective, when we get called into jobs or when I'm working from a marketing with a casting or even in development, sometimes we have to fight. And, and sometimes our actors know, sometimes the directors know, sometimes they don't. But when I go in to help greenlight a film, I have to fight to say, hey, why can't this person be diverse? What's wrong with this character? Why can't we look at some diverse uh, directors? Can you talk from your vantage point from uh, the casting side of how diversity sits in those conversations on the executive level. Absolutely. Um, well, he here's what I have to say. Everybody's journey is different, but my specific journey ac actually coming out of FAMU was unique in that my first boss was Spike Lee. And Spike, it wasn't contractual, but he made it known to the unions in New York and everybody working that all his department heads need to look like him. And if they didn't exist, you need to train the next generation. So on his next film, we be his department. And, it's, and he stuck to that for 20 plus years. So I came out of that camp, and I didn't understand where it came from until I worked on the Maynard documentary. And I realized that Spike went to Morehouse when Maynard was in office. And when Maynard said, on all the banks in Atlanta, somebody of color has to be on your executive board, they, they told him no. And he was like, OK, well, I'll take my money to the, to the California banks. You know what I'm saying? So I come from a history of people who, not contractually, but it was in our blood. So when we go, when usually when I go into the casting office for that fight, my resume comes with me so they know who they're fighting with. And they know what I'm going to fight for and what I've stood for for the past 30 years. Because I was trained by that lineage. Fantastic. There's another area that has to be addressed, which is with gender equality and pay. And so, Regina, um, I know there is a constant. This fight is not dead. It is constant. It is ever growing. Where women are saying, "Listen, uh, we're on set just as long as the men. We're doing just as many lines. We're, we're, you know, sometimes having to do more because we got to go through hair, makeup, wardrobe. We got all kinds of stuff we got to participate in. Why isn't our pay on an equal level?" Um, as that conversation co continues to grow. What do you think becomes some of the, the critical points of intersections? Like, how do we make it more consistent, specifically in the area for our African American women? We're seeing more and more of you on screen. But my concern is, how do we make sure that they get paid at that right level as, our, as, our male, as their male counterparts? 
Um, well, you know, I mean, it's not, this isn't obviously a new fight. Um, you know, I think how we do that is just, uh, it's not just that we're on set for as many hours. I mean, our movies are making money. Our television Girls shows are making money. I mean, Girls Trip had four female females, and, you know, black women came out, some men too, um, and white women, and they support it. You know, women support women. Women of all races support women. And so when we're able to contribute financially, then, and we're able to participate, and then we're able to gross financially, then you don't really have an argument to say we don't deserve it. A lot of times people try to say that, you know, women don't make as much because they don't, they're not, whatever excuse it is. I mean, what we're able to see now is that they're excuses and that you have to, you have to start quantifying our value. It's not just a matter of words. And I think, too, as women, you know, more females are producing, you know, and um, creating projects and vehicles and, you know, just working with someone, for example, like a Queen Latifah and a Jada and, you know, going in and saying, you know, we will, we will walk the walk and we will be unified. You know, Tiffany, where, you know, it won't happen unless this happens. And so I think as we start, you know, um, being dainty and making our demands and, um, um, you know, we continue to do that. You know, it won't, it won't be overnight, but it's a walk. And not just in this field, obviously, um, but in everything, you know, women have, um, you know, we just, we contribute not so much, but as much, you know, yep. and maybe more. Mm -hmm. if, if I may. Absolutely. Um, I also think it's, it's, it's about where we place value yeah. and, and placing value on um, being treated equitably, being treated fairly. I think in, in light of the fact that, you know, we see more and more of us, uh, people who look like us behind the scenes, and, and people are in those rooms, people are hearing those conversations. I think communication is important. I think, you know, oftentimes what we, we've done in the past is that we've, we've separated ourselves and we've kept a lot of information to ourselves, you know, close to our best. I think it's important that we help each and everybody understand what's being spoken in, in these rooms, how people are being perceived, and also some information about you know, money, what you're worth, helping people understand yeah. so that people, men and women of color can make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So then therefore, you know what you're worth. And so you can make an informed decision to say, you know what, I think I'm worth more. And then in light of that, I'm going to say no. Right. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I'm going to take a stand. And no is powerful. And, and no is very powerful. So I'm going to say no. And you have to start with that willingness. Yeah to say no, to step back, and then at the same time, know that you are supported. Mm -hmm. You know, in that you can't, we can't do this by ourselves. Right. We can't take this walk alone. We have to, we, we have to have people who are walking in step with yeah. us. Again, as I said, as supporters, but also as communicators, as informers, to let us know what is happening behind the scenes. So that- Terrence, can I say, it's really important what Russell just said, and, it, and he kind of crystallized it, but I got to reinforce it that, like, when you talk about equity for women, it's, it's really important. What, first of all, women are leading that movement, but it's important as men that we speak up and, like, really stand up, like, do, go the extra mile and be like, yo, this ain't acceptable no more. We got, like, the same way, you know, the black struggle, our fight can't just be fought by us. It, it got to be other people and other nationalities stepping out and saying, yo, this is, this is wrong. Because sometimes people ain't going to hear from, you know, we, 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 we take, tell people about our struggle all the time. But sometimes it takes one of them to say it to, the, to them for them to understand it, you know. And I'm saying them is like white folks or whatever to understand it. Sometimes it takes like a man to step out also and say, yo, this is bogus, man. This, we, can't, we can't have it like this. So I think, um, you know. To add on to that, the, I got, you know, we give our respect and say that the women are leading that movement, but we as men got to step out. And, and I'm going to call these two in my next negotiation. I'm going to be like, uh, we're coming and wrestle at. <laughs> well, I mean, it's an interesting point because, and comment, I, think, I love the way what you added to it. You guys got to understand, so when you hear terms and they say, well, somebody was a diva, or this guy was difficult to work with, so I, the great late, Aretha Franklin, 
some people you say, well, she is hard. Like this, but Aretha knew her value, mm. and what she did is she didn't discount discount her value because you didn't understand it. What she did is she made sure I'm gonna tell you what it is. I'm gonna make sure you understand it. If you can't follow it, I'm gonna walk out the door. <laughs> and so it's interesting because we know what the counterparts get and how they get treated when they come on set or when they get hired or when they get, you know, the, the level of participation, the places they go. And so when I go in and I'm saying, no, we need our black actors at Comic-Con and at this place, we need to take them here. And, you know, they, well, we don't, we're not sure. We don't, I don't know. Will they translate? I don't want to hear that mess. No, should they be on this plane? Should they be riding this? Should they be? Yes. And with, from an audience perspective, we have to support their efforts. But I love the fact that you said men have to also stand up too. So we have to sometimes be vocal and say, hey, you know, I worked recently with Queen Latifah. Queen Latifah, you, hey, she's a queen. But here's, you gotta treat her the right way. Treat her as a queen. When she walks in a room, things need to be in order. And we have to make sure we hold people accountable, including our studios and our networks so that they can do right by our talent, so they can continue to work and put out their best work. Correct? Correct. I want to transition to mentorship. Mm -hmm. uh, Russell, uh, I love, you know, on Lincoln Heights and on your programs and television shows, you, it, even in the movie The Hate You Give, you, come to, you are the leading father figure, uh, a head man position, and there's usually young people around you that you touch and mold. Yes. Um, and so, not just on screen, but I want to look at it from a diversity perspective in our industry. How do we continuously translate to our young people and mold them so that when they transition into working consistently, they come in with the right mindset? You know, I was, um, you know, I came up old school, you know, and so in that, um, I was around you know, doing plays, do, being in the theater, I was around men who were 20 years my senior. And it, there was a lot of um, be seen and not heard. There was a lot of take the lesson, you know, through, you know, through action, through what you see, you know, in front of you. And, but also these men weren't afraid to tell me when I, you know, when I was out of line, or was out of pocket or whatnot. And, and so what I'm, looking to do now as, as I get older and I'm realizing I have transitioned into that place of being a mentor, first of all, I think you have to own that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, what, you know what I mean? And you have to own that you are, I am a mentor now, and I can't, I can't walk around as an actor looking for validation. It is, it's my job now to help validate and lift others up, lift young people up give them um, thoughts, give them a fresh word, words of encouragement, that is important. But also at the same time, tell them what they don't want to hear, you know? And I think that, I think there's aspects of mentorship that's lacking. We have to have a willingness, but I also think that young people, it's not just about seeking a mentor out. It's about being, you know, doing the work along the way, um, doing your job. So that when, that when that person comes into your life, you're ready. There is no magic bullet, there's no magic pill that I can do or say to somebody to get you there. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be ready to take the journey. And I think that's important. I think a lot of um, what I see is a lot of young people who want to get into this business, uh, they oftentimes they get in for the wrong reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. They look at this as uh, celebrity, right? And, and not as a craft. You know, pers perspective and business and business. You know, and so you it, it, everything just takes time. You have to take the steps, the requisite steps to get there, and you have to just build with you know build with somebody and take on a relationship, and uh, you know build slowly. And, and I think it's important too. No, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. No, sorry. No. Sis, go ahead. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I, didn't want to, I wanted to jump on the back of what Russell was saying. Is you know, you know, despite what, whatever we've all done, but I know that. You know, I'm blessed to have the resume that I have, but one of the things that I'm proudest of is of 29 years of being in this industry, all 28 of them, I've had interns and I've mentored people and I've poured into the next generation because I realized that I am the shoulder that they stand on and I needed to make room because somebody made room for me. And, we're, and we also have to remember that we're a village and we have to take care of each other. So if you're on set and you see a person of color acting out in a way that they shouldn't, 
check them. Check them in a way that they will understand. I remember when we were doing the film Juice and the producers didn't know how to control Tupac. And it was the women in the production office that took him aside and said, listen, this is what your opportunity you have. Don't blow this for all of us. And they gave him perspective and there was a shift on the set the next day because he understood because people who looked like him had a conversation that he understood. Yeah. And one thing I want to say that that's, I believe is really helpful to our youth is if we expose them to things that, that you do, like casting directors, to, to, to lighting directors, to directors of photography, to executives. I don't, if, if, I, if our communities got exposed, one of my guys just hit me on a text like, man, there's some really good young black actors. We need an actor school here in Chicago that's like for young. You know like how many cats you can get off the, off the, that would be off the streets if they had a chance to just like express themselves through acting. So I think if we expose like our young people to what this world, they, they don't know, like we were saying about celebrity, they get excited, they want to see the, ce the celebrity in it and be like in front of the camera, but a lot of people get introduced to the photography and they like, oh, I love this. I just had that with some of my kids in my camp. They, they were doing incredible things with, with pictures and, and photography. And it's like, we got to expose them to that to know what it is. The only reason I think any of us are up here is because we have some access to some type of exposure, yeah. you know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, I'm a big proponent for the executive space. I, I'm one of the few that cut across the studios. And I t I'm, I'm a t I tell, I've told the story a couple times. I always wear a very cool blazer when I go on a lot. <laughs> I'm serious. I wear the coolest blazers. I wear my cool shoes. I'm dressed to the T. But you want to know why? It's not because I'm vain or anything. It's because I went to a studio one time. I was dressed casually. And the guy, when I got to, he asked me, he said, hey, are you the new security person? And I was like, no, I'm here to have a meeting with the president of the studio. And he's like, oh, I thought you was coming in to be part of the security team because that's the only time they see a black face. And so I made it a point, and anyone on my team, I tell them, when we step on the set, they have to know we're here for business. We're here to engage at a higher level. And so I think, I, I love when we have young people too, think about what Common just said, there's a lot of roles in the executive side, whether you're in accounting, whether you're uh, marketing, um, consider going into the industry to help make change and make decisions. You know, my job is to help dictate where content goes and what we produce, but we need more black folks uh, just in the building in general. I hate going into the meeting and I'm the only guy. Um, I'm gonna talk, comment about transitions um, because you've done some great transitions in your career. I worked on Just Right and I remember uh, when you jumped into that role and then this role and, and I saw, saw the movies continue to grow and grow and grow. One, two people like Just Right out there, thank you. Yeah, no, come on now. Okay, more. thank you. And Appreciate it. I see the performance here and the hate you give. Um, so I, I see the growth. And then what we just saw with John Legend, who is a, I'm going to say it right, EGOT, which is he has an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. So if you do not understand how big that is, Someone that was named John Stevenson, who I, I had, in, I used to do an independent concert, an independent music concert. He came and sang some songs in Atlanta. He was like, this is a cool young brother that can sing. He's transitioned in a magnificent way. Uh, as we see more and more people cut across music, sports, into film, um, and making that transition, what is something that will help them understand what it means to be black in this and bring our culture forward? But you have to have a difference in kind of how you move in the spaces. When you step into hip hop, you have to move a little different than when you step over to film. When you move out of film and you're doing television, it requires another level of commitment. What are your thoughts around the transition there? Well, I think as far as commitment, you all of it takes passion. You have like, I would suggest any, like if you try to, for me, I didn't go into acting because I was just like, man, I want to be popular. I was actually like doing hip hop music and I felt like I hit a ceiling as far as that goes, you know, because I was trying to do that out there music. Like this album I did Electric Circus and people was like, what, are the, what the hell are you doing? And, they, and, and I was just like, man, I got to find something else that I can express myself in. And I tried playing the piano and doing different things and I just went good at it. And I went to acting and I felt really passionate about it. 
And no, I wasn't good yet, but I was just, I knew in my heart and spirit that this was something that I could do and wanted to do and wanted to grow at. And I think anybody that's saying, yo, if, you, if we suggesting that people get into other fields and when you start expanding, the, I think the best thing we can do in the world to make ourselves happy and, and give the world what we're supposed to is find our purpose and find our purpose and, and contribute that purpose to the world. And like, if you're just going to get into producing just because you know you want the hype or you want to wear the fresh suits, then I don't know, man. I, that ain't always the best way to do it. To me, I think it's it's got to be some some like heart into it. You got to put your soul. That's where we get the best out of our lives and the products that we do. Um, and everything we contribute. So, I mean, that's just my perspective on it. I mean, I, everybody has their own path, but that's where I am with it. Fantastic. Regina, I want to end with you before we bring up David Morgan, the president of the MMCA. And as I was going through your bio and learning more, I actually, I called, uh, I said, I went to school with Will, with Packer, and we're good friends. And I called Will, I was like, man, tell me something about, you know, Regina. I'm trying to find something different that's not on the paper. And one of the things that he mentioned was that he was like, man, I'm telling you, she is so smart. He's like, not only is she just educated, but he was like, she's quick, she's fast, like she's witty, she, she can just bring it. Um, and so when conversations come up, he was like, you know, Regina's ready. And I was like, okay, so you mean, he did say that. He did say that. And so, <laughs> One of the things, when we talk about diversity in media and connecting with folks, um, and, and, and I'm connecting this to your ability to be you know, on point, present in the, in the space, um, how does that translate? Sometimes I feel, and this is from a, a gender perspective, sometimes people get, um, they pull back or they say, oh wow, this woman, she can, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm the person to connect with her, especially when you're talking to another woman, mother, white women, white men, do you find that there's sometimes a ability for you, a window for you to go forward, or do you think it creates them, you know, it pulls them back where they're a little concerned, like we're not sure how to treat her? Um, fortunately, I have not found that. You know, I've, I've really found that people have been, people, you know, in rooms when we're engaged in conversation that is helpful towards what we're all trying to do. I haven't really found that people pull back. I mean, one of the things about Will that's so amazing is um, the amount of opportunity, you know what I mean, that Will has provided. And especially, you know, well, for everyone, but especially for me, Will gave me just recently my first time to be able to um, executive produce. And, and um, you know, thank you. The reason that was like exciting was one, it was a great opportunity, but I, I also always felt heard. You know, I always felt heard in those rooms when we talked about, you know, trimming and scripts and ideas, and it was wonderful to be able to have Marseille, um, who is such an amazing actress. She's young, she's 13, and then Issa Rae, which are, you know, those are two di different generations than I am, and actually be able to be like, how can I make what they're doing even better? You know what I mean? So how can, what can my talent or wit or whatever will think, um, how can that serve this project and how can it serve, you know, the movie, the women, the talent, you know, and, and, and so I, I find that there have been a lot of men and then and a lot of women who are actually open to receiving the ideas and sometimes wit has helped because it hasn't felt, you know, maybe heavy handed, maybe because it's been, you know, subtle and sometimes people can handle the subtlety more than they can handle the handle it, you know, receiving it in other ways. So it hasn't been been and I mean, you know, you know when to use it too. You know, you always learn to read a room and you know, discernment is, you know, what do they say? It's a gift of the spirit, but you also know that, you know, it's necessary. So I mean the opportunities have been there and I, I just you know, Will's not here. But you know, one of the things about Will is Will is very He's so smart, and, and Will really knows when to allow someone to have an opportunity to, to grow like he is. Um, Will's present, too. Look, it sounds like I have a Will affair. I'm like, <laughs> Will is so sweet. No, but, um, <laughs> no, it's just been, you know, but you know, being able to be able to use that part, which is you, and you know, and, and, and allow it to serve what you do, is, it's great. Fantastic, thank you much. Give our panel a hand again. Now I would like to bring up David Morgan, the president of the MMCA.
Thank you, Tara. Uh, wasn't that dope? Wow, look at God. Uh, when we envisioned bringing Hollywood and Washington together to tackle this really important issue and move the needle on media diversity, this is what we envisioned. Thank you to this amazing panelist for bringing us this love. Uh, I have my beautiful wife in the audience, Kavon Small. And uh, I brought that up because why this is so important to me, we have a four-year-old son, beautiful black boy. And my biggest job is to make this a better world for him. I want him to dream and imagine enormous dreams. I want him to believe he can be common, Russell, Sheriff Demings, Congresswoman Demings, Angie Gates, executives, everybody that he can be, and Tiffany Norwood. We can dominate every space, and our kids, black and brown kids across the country, need that. So they need us. So here's my call to action. Uh, we need your help. We're trying to build a tribe. Our website is MMCADC. Our social media is at MMCADC. There is currently a resolution in Congress that Congressman Demings is pushing. And this is important. Because what it does, it reaffirms Congress's commitment to this issue and encourages these type of conversations and actually designate a full month to focus on media diversity and awareness. So my ask is that you guys get engaged, sign our petitions, we have a petition, and more importantly, we want to do a campaign on social media where you go on and just tell us why you care about the issue. And it's at, at MMCADC, I care about media diversity at org. And we'd like to build this movement and this tribe. And thank you all so much. Um, um, but I was going to uh, take the privilege of uh, bringing up the congresswoman, but I'm going to have um, Terrell take some questions because I hear the audience is, is dying to hear some from the panelists. So we've got some extra time. The congresswoman, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take two questions. Now, let me be clear. Let me be very, very clear. These need to be questions, and they better be good. So I'm gonna take two, well she done ran to the mic, you raising your hand, you gotta move. <laughs> My two people are at the mic. So again, very specific, direct, and good question. <laughs> Otherwise we're gonna boo. Hi, this question is for Regina Hall. Um, I went to what, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Michelle Coker, I'm with Open Voice Media. So I, I met you very briefly at the American Black Film Festival when you were their ambassador, and I handed you my card on the red carpet, and um, I said I had a wonderful story idea for you and Kevin, and I still oh, I do. Think I do remember that. <laughs> and so, how do I get in contact with you, or in the room with you, or a conversation with you to share that idea? Baby, so you you about to get booed. <laughs> Now, I'm glad you bold enough to get to the mic and ask that question. That's a great question. You know what? I love that you did that, too. And these are the opportunities you have to take it. So you know what? I'm going to get your information today, and I will read your script. Absolutely. There it is. Thank you. Go ahead. Good job. Now, hold up. Hold up. I have a script, too. Hold, 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 hold up. Is this question about your script? No, sir. OK, thank you. But make sure there's a question. Yes, sir. Okay, thank I am Keisha B. Nelson. I am co-owner of Black Broadway Performing Arts Company with my husband, Cleveland Nelson. We work here in D.C. And we expose our students um, and partnering with agencies and schools in the community to teach them performing arts. My question. I'm getting the eyes. I appreciated hearing about your value of mentorship and leveraging your, res your resources to reach back. And I was wondering what community-based projects you all are connected to and interested in supporting. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, um, for me, I have a foundation called the Common Ground Foundation. Yes. 
and it's based in Chicago. And um, man, what we do is we mentor youth. Like we mentor them through for academic purposes, character development. Now we've added the social impact component, um, health and nutrition, and we found it to be very beneficial. Our, our graduation rate has been 100%, meaning the kids we started at 14, all of them ended up going to college. God bless the soul of one, one we lost to the streets, but but um, man, like I've noticed, the reason why we even de did this and, and the reason why I feel like it's important that we tie into our youth is like, for me, the reason I was able to do something, I, I grew up on the same South Side they did, but because I had somebody that was like, hey, you can do something in life, or you know, when I was tripping, I still had somebody that was inspiring me and I had a, a you know, they say eyes on the prize. I had something to look forward to and a prize. And we just want to give our children a prize to look forward to and expose them so they can discover what that prize is. And that's what I've been tied into. And also Imagine Justice, where we do criminal justice. We work on a lot of criminal justice reform projects. We've been going into the prisons in, um, in California and meeting with people in, in prisons in California and listening to them. And we did a few concerts and we helped get some bills passed in California. So, so don't test the God. And just to say a little bit about what we're doing in Atlanta um, with WSA and Kairos Films, which is our production company, we're still ushering in interns. We're still very committed to training the next generation of filmmakers. Filmmaking is what I'm passionate about. And um, in 2019, we'll be partnering with the Cal Entertainment Commission in terms of also getting the word out more. And because Atlanta's been hit by like this burst of filmmaking. And we're playing catch up in certain ways to make sure that we can support all the work that's coming there. I am committed, and my company's committed to making sure that people who look like us have a great shot at the job because they're qualified, not because of what they look like. So now, if you will stand to your feet, I'd like for you to give a hand clap of appreciation for Representative Val Demi. Thank you. 